Hey YouTube, I'm going to show you the changes I've made to the Maker Plane Ephus. Uh, kind of go over the new way to configure things and some of the old stuff in case you're unfamiliar with it. In the configuration file, the first section here is uh, this main section. Important things here is your screen width, your screen height. Um, this here will define the default screen that you want displayed as you can have different screens and, and switch between them. So. This is a new feature here, the node ID. This is used just in the new feature of touch screen buttons. So we'll go over this a little bit later, uh, but each node uh, in your system, so your left and your right should have a different node ID and it does need to be a number. They have the key binding so you can define shortcut keys such as uh, X for exit. Uh, pretty straightforward stuff there. So the outputs. So these are data values that we want the EFIS to output to the fixed gateway. Uh, we'll discuss why you might need to do that a little bit later. Then we get into the screen section, and this is where the most changes have really been made. Uh, so I've created this new module called the Screen Builder, which allows you to define the instruments within this configuration file here. You can see here's a, my list of instruments. Before this, the way you would configure a screen is you would need to write some Python code, which looks something like this. So you would need to define a, a screen class. You need to know the special names of the devices or the class names for the instruments that you want to install. Oh, here's another instrument, the altimeter tape, HSI. Then you have to define resize events and what happens when those when that's fired off um, this one has some special check engine function in it you see it's rather confusing um, certainly not very helpful to somebody that's never used the system before there is a feature called a virtual VFR if you're using that you do need to define the database path and index path um, well, let's get into the screen builder. So the first section is the layout. Really the only things that's important here is the rows and columns. So the rows just define how many rows you want to deal with and defining where you want something and how many columns you have. Uh, zero, zero is the top left corner. And as you increase, we move towards the bottom right corner. So I forgot to mention that we also have this draw grid feature. So if you were to enable that on one of your screens and then restart the EFIS, it will actually draw a grid on the screen and also provide the indexes on the top and on the left so you can see exactly where your instruments are located and what row and column values you might want to change things to to help you get your layout just the way you want it. And that's what that grid, those grid settings are for the rows and columns for the grid and the layout is to define how many uh, rows and columns that you want. And now you can see that. Uh, also, the rows and grids will only draw on the screens that you enable them on. So if you only put that on the one screen, it'll only show up on that screen. And you can also just set it to false to turn that off or just delete that setting because the default setting is false. So we restart it here and it'll come back up without the grid now. So we define a, a list of instruments. So we have this Weston instrument and we define where we want the top left corner located for a row and column. And then we can define 
how many rows and columns we want that instrument to occupy. So zero, and we go to 113, and then the columns are zero to 155. Some instruments have options. The options that are available are specific to the instrument. And to show you what this uh, does here, this Weston instrument, if we go back to the EFIS and we click on this map here, so Weston displays the uh, Android window within this system here. And you can see that this is the area it's occupying, the 00 to 113, 155. I only have 110 columns defined, um, and I did 113 because I wanted to, a little bit more space for the applications that run in here and less for the uh, Android uh, taskbar down here at the bottom. So I kind of put that halfway off screen. And the Android's going to keep complaining at us because I haven't registered the Play Store with my account yet. So I'm going to uh, restart the EFIS so we don't have to listen to that beeping all the time. I'm going to go down here to the primary flight display, which is this screen here. Again, I have the same rows and columns defined. Here, I don't have any instruments defined in this main configuration file, so I've actually used a, this include type. So we're including this other configuration file. This include uh, will be placed at row and column 00. zero. And whatever rows and columns defined in this include file will be placed relative to uh, the row and column defined here. Let's take a look at this virtual VFR config. So we start out with our list of instruments. Uh, so I have the virtual VFR instrument which is the background that you see here, the brown and blue. It will actually display um, runways and airports on here, along with glide slope indicators, uh, if we had some GPS coordinates, which we don't down here in the basement, and if we were flying over an airport. So that instrument you know, is located at 00, zero and it spans 110 to 155 columns. So that's the whole area you see here. So the next instrument, the horizontal situation indicator, it's our compass rows. I also define that to span 110 to 155 columns, but I didn't actually want it that big. So what I've done here is that I've told it to shrink by 12%. So instead of occupying the whole space, we've shrunk it down a little bit. But since we shrunk it from the same coordinates, it stays centered within the virtual VFR. You can also shrink things and then justify them. So let me show you if we change the shrink. Let's say we shrink at 50% instead. So we'll save that and then we'll reload the EFIS. And this is a good way to build your configuration files is you know, just edit them, press X for exit, let it reload. So there you can see it's reloaded much smaller. Now if we uh, set the justify option on and say we justify top, it's going to move it all the way to the top now instead of being centered. There you see. And you can also specify right or bottom or left. So we can also do you know a top and side together or vertical and side together.
There, so we're at the top right. And you can see that it stays within the bounding box that we've defined here with the uh, rows and columns. So quite a few different options on placement of the instruments to get them exactly where you want them to be. And we'll put this back the way that it was. Most of the instruments have a font percent option, uh, so that'll set the size of the font based on the percentage of usually either the width or the height, uh, depending on the instrument, uh, which the height or the width is used. For example, these tapes use the width to specify the size of the uh, font here, where other things might use the height. So if we change the font percent here, so let's do, we'll make it quite a bit larger. Oh, so I have an error in the um, configuration file. I didn't realize. Let's resave it. Hopefully it'll open up for us again. There we are. I think we made them way too big. Let's just do like nine. Let's see what we get with that. There you can see they're quite a bit bigger. Now on the uh, EMS screen, we have the same virtual VFR instrument, but it's made a little bit smaller, and you'll see that the size of the fonts uh, scale in proportion to the size that's taken up on the screen. So it tries to adjust everything to keep it looking the, the way that you've defined it to be. back to the way that we were when we started. You can see there's quite a few instruments that make up this whole virtual VFR section. You know, you've got autopilot mode, we've got our heading, we've got the AHARs, we've got your time, vertical speed indicator, altimeter, airspeed indicator. We've got touch screen buttons here. And we have the uh, control that's displaying there for what the trims are doing. We have a barometric pressure, density altitude, pressure altitude, or erroneous outside air temperature. So all of that makes up this include instrument. And as we put that on the other screen, we get all of the exact same components just scaled to the different size that we decided to place it in. This vertical bar gauge here is our pitch trim. So you see the name pitch, which actually shows up on the screen, pitch. Uh, we don't want to show any decimal places. Uh, we don't want to show the units. We don't want to show the value. Then the database key here, this trim key. So that's the name of the variable that we're displaying here. Uh, these all come from the fixed gateway. We'll talk about that a little bit later as well. This is one of the new features I've added is these touch screen buttons. Uh, so you'll see I have this button placed at row 78, column one, 
which that's this button right here. I've told it to span 12 rows and nine columns, which gives it its size. And then on the options on buttons, yeah, the buttons have a configuration file, so each button can have its own config. And you can reuse this configuration file for different buttons on the screen. So let's take a look at that. So this button is defined as a repeat button, which means if you click on it and hold it, it will keep performing the action that's defined until you let go of the button. This is the text we want to display in the button, and in this case we don't want to display any text in here. Uh, that word pitch comes from the vertical bar indicator, not the button. Here's another database key. So if we want to reuse this same button configuration on our left screen and the, the right screen, we need to have a way to identify which uh, database key is unique to the left or the right button. Uh, and that's important in cases where you might want to have a physical button to perform some action. For example, I do plan to have here in the middle a, a momentary toggle switch that you can just push rather than having to push the touch screen to uh, click these buttons. So I'll have a toggle button next to each one of these. If you push it to the right, it'll click this button. If you push it to the left, it'll click this button. And the way to accomplish that is we put this, we define our button name and then we put in this special bracketed ID. And this ID gets replaced with that node ID that we talked about at the beginning, this node ID here. So on this left screen, this ID gets replaced with a one, so it'll be TSBTN13 is the actual database key that is used here. Uh, the right screen is two, so it would be TSBTN23. Here you can define the repeat interval in milliseconds and then the repeat delay in milliseconds. This is where the buttons really become pretty powerful. Now this being just a, a simple repeat button here, it's not doing a whole lot. We're saying that when this button is clicked, so clicked is true, we are going to take the action of changing the value of the trim P database key by 0 0.1. So every time you click that button, it's going to change trim P by 0 0.1. The button for the down uh, trim is uh, exactly the same except it is changes by negative 0.1. There are some more complex buttons and probably one of the more complex ones is this um, EMS button up here and you'll see that this EMS button is currently lit up as red. Uh, and that's because I've sent some data to this side uh, to indicate that there's a problem. And the problem being the uh, cylinder head temperatures here. You can see they're highlighted red. The way this is working here, so this is a a simple button which is something that you click it once it performs the action you click it again it performs the action uh, we have a list of condition keys here which are the EGTs and CHTs whenever a CHT or EGT changed these conditions listed here will also be evaluated um, also when you click on the button these conditions are evaluated and we've got a long list of conditions here so the first condition so 
when the screen is the EMS screen. So if we are on this screen right here, we set the text to PFD, which you'll see that it has done. And we set the color to light gray, which it has also done. We have this continue true by default. The moment that something is evaluates as true, so screen equals EMS would evaluate to true, it stops processing and does not process any further unless you have continue true. So we have continue true here, so it will go on and evaluate the next thing. So here it's saying if we're on the screen PFD or the uh, screen map, then we'll set the text to EMS so we can do that. So if we're on PFD, it sets to EMS. And then here it does say to set it to light gray, and you'll notice it's not light gray, it's red right now. Well, again, we have continue true. And the reason that it's getting set red is this is evaluating to true. So we are saying that if the screen is not on, if we're not on the EMS screen, and any of the CHTs or EGTs are enunciating, which is what I manually set to trigger that, um, it says to perform the action of setting the background color red, which you can see that it has done. So that's a simple way to alert you that, hey, there's a problem here that you need to go check out. And you can click on it and check it out. And again, we continue on. So here's where it actually flips between the screens. So this condition is if you have clicked on the button and we're on the PFD or the map screen, then we will take the action of showing the screen EMS. So if we're on the PFD screen and we click it, it takes us to the EMS screen. At that point, since we do not have continue true, it stops and does not process any further. If this was false, it means we're probably on this screen, so it's going to say if you were clicked and that the screen equates EMS, then we show the PFD screen. The reason that we do need to define that the button was clicked here is because, as I mentioned, when you click the button, the conditions are evaluated, or if any of these condition keys change, the condition is evaluated. So as the CHTs are constantly changing, these conditions are constantly being evaluated, mostly just to get to here to, and uh, to decide if we should set that red or not. So that's one of the complex things you can do with buttons. The autopilot buttons uh, are, have some complex logic in them as well. Like for example, you can see that they're red right now. I can't even click them. It won't let me click them because currently the flight controller is not in a mode that it can be armed because we don't have any GPS coordinates down here in the basement. Now we're going to take a look at the fixed gateway configuration. So the first important new feature I've added is this quorum plugin. You can define how many total nodes you have and then assign each node an ID. If all of the nodes are running, the node with the highest ID is the node that will be considered the leader. And in this case, that's uh, the left side here. I put a indicator uh, which is just a button that I've colored here for leader is green and then you can see on the follower we have red with an F so we know which node is the leader at this moment. If for some reason the fixed gateway application on this one were to fail the right side is going to take over and become the leader to keep the critical functions that only the leader performs running. So we can do that here by stopping the fixed gateway. And there you can see that the right side has now become the leader. We don't have a fixed gateway over here so we've lost 
all of our data and that's displayed to the pilot to let them know uh, we don't have any data to give you at the moment. So I'm going to grab my encoder for the barometric pressure here and you can see here over on the right screen I'm turning it and adjusting it. Only the leader actually will change the barometric value in response to this encoder being turned. So we are going to start I'm going to put a few second delay here and then start the fixed gateway back up over here. So you can see what happens when this node becomes the leader again. So see we're changing it right now the right side is performing the changes. And now just the left side is performing those changes. And everything keeps on working pretty smoothly. The reason it's important to have this quorum and this leader followers, imagine for example there is some latency between the communication between these two nodes. Um, there could be other applications that are running on here that might consume CPU resources causing one node to be faster or slower than the other. So imagine both of these are going to change this encoder value as the encoder is changed, or change the barometric value as the encoder is changed. If the left side were to add 0.1 when we turn it one notch, and then send that barometric value over here to the right side, and then the right side then picks up and decides to process and add another 0.1 from the encoder input that it saw. Now we've moved it two instead of one. So by configuring the encoder input to only be calculated on the leader, we avoid that problem so that we don't have duplicate calculations which could lead to errors. I have made quite a few changes to the compute module, mostly to add a couple of new functions uh, and the, the biggest change is to deal with this leader uh, situation. So the EGT values and the CHT values, those are provided by the MGL RDAC that I have that's sent on the CAN bus, so that data gets sent to both nodes at the same time. So in that case, it's okay for each side to calculate its own, say, average, you know, mm -hmm. the span or max values of those. The fuel quantities, those also come from the MGL RDAC, and it's okay that we add them all together independently because both sides have the same data all the time and they're only providing that summary database key to the local EFIS connected to that fixed gateway. I forgot to update my latest configs. This is a fairly recent feature that I've added. So we'll go back in here. So in order to allow those um, calculations to happen even if you're not the leader. We've added this required required leader option, which defaults to true. So by default, the leader is always required, but you can set this to false where it doesn't matter. So you can look at what it is that you're calculating, where the data is coming from, and whether or not you're distributing that data to other nodes. Um, you can make the decision whether the leader is required or not on that computation. Here we have the encoder function with the input of encoder 1. We're outputting Barrow with the multiplier of 0 0.01. So every time we every time we increase the uh, encoder, if we turn it to the right, we'll add 0 0.01 to the barometric pressure value and then send that information out to the rest of the nodes connected on the CAN bus. 
If you turn it to the left, it then subtracts rather than adds. Uh, the encoder buttons also have a, a button that you can push on them. So here we have the set function. So we're, when button one is pressed, we're going to set the barometric value to 29.92. So we can see that if we go back and look at the barometric pressure and we push the encoder button, it gets reset to 29.92. We have the same feature on the encoder buttons for uh, the pitch control as well. I don't know, I can't get these onto the screen. I'm not sure. They're kind of stuck right here on the edge. So you can see I'll reset the pitch to center. We're going to look for another new plugin that I've created, which here we are, Mavlink. So this will connect to an RG Pilot over serial port uh, using the Mavlink protocol. Currently, both the left and the right screen have a serial port connection that's independent of each other to the flight controller. I'm going to unplug the USB serial port adapter on the left screen so you can see what happens here. So let's say if, for example, a loose wire happened while we're flying, you can see that we've lost data here on the left screen, but the right screen is still connected and functional, getting data from the flight controller. The moment we're able to restore that connection, so say if it was a loose wire, it reconnects itself through some turbulence. The system will detect that and reconnect and get back to working normal again. So within uh, the Mavlink, there's quite a few options. Uh, the only type I have implemented at the moment is serial. I'm thinking about maybe implementing the uh, can interface at some point. You can also specify the uh, device name for your USB serial port adapter, what baud rate you want to use, and then what things you want to collect from the uh, flight controller. So another new plugin I've added here is this iFly plugin. Uh, this is a fairly simple plugin. So what this does is when you're running iFly GPS and you have a flight plan loaded up, whatever your next waypoint is, uh, that, that gets sent out on the network. And this iFly plugin will pick up that information that iFly GPS is outputting and bring that into the fixed gateway. And with that, we now have the GPS coordinates, the name of the waypoint. So within the EFIS, um, once iFly is outputting uh, a flight plan with waypoints on it, if the autopilot was armable, the flight plan button would become armable. And if you were to click that, the autopilot would start navigating towards that waypoint. Um, and then it would also indicate a pair that it is in that mode and what the name of the waypoint that it's navigating to is. One of the things I've also implemented uh, within that Mavlink uh, plugin is when you have the autopilot engaged, uh, these uh, buttons for the pitch roll and yaw uh, are disabled and the sliders actually indicate what the position of the trim tabs that the autopilot is commanding. So you can actually kind of see how exactly the autopilot is controlling the airplane. The autopilot adjust button here, uh, when the autopilot is engaged, if you click the autopilot adjust button, 
then you can use the yaw and the pitch buttons to adjust your altitude or your course. So if you were, for example, in heading hold mode, you could use the yaw to change your heading after you click AP adjust. Once you are on the heading that you want, you could either just recenter the yaw or just disengage the autopilot adjust mode and then it'll stay on that current heading. Um, and the same with the uh, flight plan. If it was navigating towards a waypoint and you want to change altitude, you can click the AP adjust, you know, pitch up. Um, you can, you're basically setting a, a climb rate as you're adjusting the pitch here. Once you are at the altitude you want, you can recenter and disengage the autopilot adjust mode. And then it'll maintain that altitude on the way to the waypoint. So another plugin that I've added is for the Mega Squirt, uh, for the ECU for my engine. I'm planning to run an Aero Momentum AM13, which comes with a Mega Squirt EMS, mm -hmm. and this will pick up the CAN data off of the CAN bus from the EMS, so we can display that information within the uh, EFIS or yeah, within the EFIS. Here we can define what um, components that we want to bring in. And since I don't have that yet, I don't know for certain that it works, but I'm pretty confident that it will. And whatever bugs are in it, once I get the EMS, I'll figure that out and get it fixed for us so other, other people can use it as well. Uh, here's another plugin I've created is the MGL. So I am using an MGL RDAC because the Megasquirt EMS does not provide enough inputs for every sensor that I'd like to have. Um, and also, uh, you know, I have things like, you know, fuel tank sensors and, and outside air temperature sensors and stuff like that that I'd like to have. So those will all be plugged into the MGL RDAC. Uh, the RDAC that I have is the RDAC XG. It's just a little over $200. It's pretty affordable for sensor input uh, rather than trying to build something myself. So here um, you specify the uh, CAN interface that it's using, uh, what your RDAC ID is, so you can have one, two, three, or four, the default is one, um, and you can send or get data from as an RDAC. So you, you can make the fixed gateway act as if it is a RDAC and send data to other MGL components that you might have uh, on your system. I have uh, the double D here because I don't actually want to send something right now, so that was just my way of disabling the send function. I just left that there because it was easy to delete or add a single character when I was testing that. Uh, so here we define what we're getting, and these uh, labels all come from the MGL RDAC uh, CAN specification. So you can look at that specification to figure out what they are. Uh, some items need to have a, a calibration, uh, like for example, this fuel level sensor. I'd want to calibrate, you know, what the RDAC outputs when I have, you know, zero gallons, and you know what it's outputting when I have one gallon, and two gallons, and three gallons, and so forth. And it will all interpolate in between. And the this here is the fix database key that gets populated from the RDAX value. We need to talk about the CAN bus. So the fix gateway has its own specification for communicating data across the CAN bus called uh, CAN fix. This is where we define if what we want to bring in from the CAN bus or send on the CAN bus. So these are our list of inputs. So I'm inputting the barometric pressure, pressure altitude, and putting the trim pitch, trim roll, trim yaw. All of these IDs that, uh, that you see here, 
might look a little confusing. If you download the CanFix specification document, you can find all this information. It's pretty straightforward once you start reading it. So we also have outputs. So here we're outputting you know, barometric, pressure altitude, the trims, density altitude. So by default, on change value is true. And what that means is that it only outputs if the data value actually changes. So if the barometric pressure remains at 29.92, uh, even if something were to update that to say reset it to 29.92 such as you know pressing the the button on the uh, encoder every time we do that it's setting that value to 29.92 but since it's not actually changing it's not going to send that information out on the can buzz if we set on change to false then whenever the piece of data is set it will send that out on the can bus and the reason to do that is in situations where a fixed gateway might restart uh, mid-flight. So say there was an exception for some reason of you know, a bug in the fixed gateway and it threw an exception on, on one of the nodes but not both. When that one node restarts and comes back up, which it will do automatically, the that fixed gateway will reset all of its values to the defaults. And if we had already had our barometric pressure set to something, we wouldn't want it to be automatically set back to the 29.92 all on its own just because that gateway restarted. And this helps deal with that along with this require leader false. So the required leader false allows the data to be sent if you're not the leader. The default is to only send data if you're the leader. So the encoders are set up where you have two encoders per fix ID or for per can ID. And then you can have up to, I think, eight buttons, if I remember correctly. Uh, I only have the code for my encoders programmed to send two buttons, one for each encoder. So button one is for encoder one, encoder two's button is button two. You can send up to eight different indexes with the same CAN ID. So I have four total encoders connected to a single microcontroller so that one microcontroller sends all four encoders and all four buttons with the same CAN ID, just with a different index. On to the switches. Each CAN ID can send the status of up to 40 different buttons, and those buttons are you define the fix ID that you want each button uh, to be populated from and you just separate them with a comma here. So if you had 40 buttons, you could put 40 fix IDs here all in a row. Now those buttons work such that when you, the all of the physical buttons should be momentary buttons. You shouldn't have any uh, buttons that stay switched even if they are a toggle button. So each time you push that button, it will send essentially a true, it'll set that value, that fix ID to true. When the button is released, it gets set to false. The exception to that is in the case of a toggle mm -hmm. button. So if we're looking at the buttons we have here, so we had repeating buttons like the barometric pressure that's a repeating button so as long as that button is true it should be changing so if we created a physical push button for each of these if you push the increment one as long as you were holding it, it would keep incrementing when you let go it would stop the simple buttons here like the ems if we had a physical button for that if we pushed it one time 
it would switch the screen, push it again, it switches the screen again. It doesn't matter if you were to hold it down, if you push and hold it, it works just like it does right here on the touch screen where it uh, hasn't performed any action until you release it. Uh, the only difference is on the physical buttons, if you push and hold it, it will perform the action right away, but it will not repeat the action and will not create a new action until you release it and push it again. In the case of toggle buttons, which all of the autopilot buttons are, there are things that you turn on or off, or they are on and off. Um, of course, the flight controller could run into an error and turn itself off, which would also cause the button to toggle. So in those cases, the momentary buttons from the physical buttons um, simply send a signal that the button has been pressed uh, each time the button is pressed. It does not continue to send uh, a signal that the button is pressed. So when you push that button, it will send on the CAN bus a true that the button was pushed and then immediately send a false. And it will not send another true until the button is released and then depressed again. And for those buttons, you would need to define which one of them, which is only this AP adjust button at the moment out of this list, that is a toggle button. So you list the toggle buttons the same. You would separate each one with a comma and list out all of the buttons that are toggle buttons from this particular input. And what that does is within the fixed gateway, when it sees that true, it will toggle the value. So if the current value of AP adjust was true, it would set it to false. If it was currently false, it would set it to true. That way you can have a single button that can perform both actions. So I wanted to demonstrate these uh, physical buttons and how they work. So I've got my right and left. These are mapped to the top two buttons here. When you push one and, and hold it in, it doesn't repeat the action because this is not a repeat button. Uh, and it will not perform another action until you've let go and then push it again. Now, if this was mapped to a repeating button, like the uh, pitch control, for example, or the barometric pressure, then it would repeat. And if it was mapped to a, a toggle button, uh, each time you push it, it would toggle once. Well, that's just about it. I don't, can't think of anything else that's new or relevant. So have a great day.